Hi everyone, welcome to today's NEASC Forum. My name is Kelly Christian. I'm the Director of Strategy and Membership here at NEASC. I am a member of the leadership team and it's my privilege to be deeply involved with our professional learning across all of our schools uh, here at NEASC. We are so pleased that we have people representing uh, dozens of countries and states across the United States joining us today. We're gonna be talking from public schools, independent schools and international schools, how everyone is managing and tackling the discussion of cell phone policies. We have four schools joining us today, representing all of those perspectives that I just mentioned, and we'll have our panelists introduce themselves in just a few minutes. And so we will turn it right over to my colleague, Edie Trena, who will get us started and meet the panelists. Thanks so much, Kelly, and good morning, everyone. Good evening, good afternoon. We're so happy to have you here with us today. My name's Edie Trena. I am the director of NEAS Commission on Independent Schools, and we're excited to talk about this important topic. I am recently fresh from the world of schools. I'm also the parent of two teenagers, so we talk about cell phones a lot. Let's hear from our panelists a few introductions. We're gonna start with Kevin and Ruby. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Kevin McCaskill, principal at Brockton High School in Brockton, Massachusetts, which is in the greater Boston area, south of about 20 miles south of Boston. And we are Massachusetts' largest high school with 3,700 students. Ruby? Hi, I'm Ruby. I'm a senior at Brockton High School. I've gone here all four years. Wonderful. Christine? Hi, I'm Christine Henderson. I'm a high school English teacher at the International School of Krakow. We are right outside of Krakow, Poland. Uh, I, uh, we are about a 350 student school from early years to grade 12, so relatively small. And this is our first year with a no cell phone policy here. Hi, I'm Ephesine, and I'm an uh, 11th grade student at ISK. I've been going here for about seven years. And along with being outside of the US, we are also a CISA school, which is the Central Eastern European School Association. So our school partakes in a lot of like, and a lot of integrating activities with many other schools in Central Eastern Europe. Wonderful, John. Hi, my name is John Calipos. I'm the associate head of school at Buxton School. Uh, we're a small progressive boarding school in Western Massachusetts. Um, it's very rural in Williamstown. Uh, we are in our third year of an entirely cell phone free um, policy, um, and we are in a boarding school context. Um, I'll pass it over to JP. Hi, I'm JP. I'm a senior at Buxton School. I've been here all four years. Um, yeah. Wonderful. And Aaron. Hi, everyone. My name is Aaron Robb. I'm principal at Wakona Regional High School. Uh, we are in the very western part of Massachusetts in the uh, heart of the Berkshires. Uh, we're a 9 through 12 public high school, great, um, about 450 students. Uh, and we're in our second year of a phone-free environment at our school. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. We're going to start off by hearing a little bit about where each school stands on their cell phone policy. What's your current policy? How'd you get there? And how are things working? So Aaron, you started us off there with a little more information. Do you mind taking the lead there? Sure. So we're in our second year of a phone free environment. Um, basic, our basic rule is that the phones are not to be seen or heard during the school day. So that means from the moment of morning arrival until our 221 dismissal bell. Um, students are free to use them after school, but not during school. Um, this this started quite, this was kind of treated more or less, I hate to say that use this word, but as a crisis um, that needed to be dealt with. Um, we were getting a ton of uh, feedback from our teachers um, and our teachers don't normally have, complain about much, but there was a lot of feedback that we were getting that they, they just couldn't teach anymore, that the phones were so much um, uh, in the way of, of teaching and learning um, that they asked for something to be done about it. Um, I talked with our central office administration, our district administration, uh, and they worked with our school committee to update the technology policy in our school district. Um, so uh, last year was our first year of implementation, um, and this is our second year, and the second year is going 
uh, a lot easier than the first year um, because uh, it's kind of the way we do things now. Um, but that's that's kind of how we got here. Wonderful. Thank you. Christine, would you speak about your school, please? Yes. So we actually have a somewhat similar story to Aaron there, uh, although we're one year behind. Uh, we in two years ago, we essentially had no controls over cell phones or no restrictions around them. They were in free use. Uh, and about halfway through the year, we are seeing some pretty significant issues happening in classrooms. So we removed them from middle school classes uh, completely. Last year, it was more a teacher discretionary in the classroom for high school. And similarly, we just had a lot of concerns, a lot of people coming concerned about the usage of the cell phones in classrooms. Even students who didn't feel comfortable saying it to their peers were coming to our, our leadership team and saying, this is impacting learning, it's impacting bullying, it's impacting social issues. So that began a process of research. And over the summer, the leadership team made the decision this year, absolutely no cell phones uh, in the school. So similar process, we don't have them locked or hidden away. It's just simply, we don't wanna see them or hear them from beginning to end of the school day, uh, but can use them afterwards for school pickup and things like that. Thanks, Christine. Kevin. We're actually in our initial year of implementation and similar to Aaron and Christine, I had a crisis. And when you have 3,700 students, and that's, that's quite a crisis of, of phone with phones and the such. And they were creating such an issue, just not in the classroom, but in our hallways. And you know, when students are texting each other about where to meet up and skip and, you know, and just leaving the school and leaving the school period, was creating a problem. So working with the school committee, as well as the central office cabinet, the policy was established early in the late winter. And we started working with the organization yonder of purchasing well over 4,000 pouches, which it was going to be a policy, a creating a cell phone free environment. And the one thing that we really had to emphasize was this was not punishment. We wanted to have two simple premises of how why this policy was going to be implemented. One was get the focus back on education. Everything we do is getting everything back into the classroom where we can get the total attention of students to really understand the task at hand, coming to school to learn every single day. And the second was really to, to bring back the art of conversation. You know, students were so in tune to looking at their cell phones and you know, when you're a principal walking, you see two people sitting two feet from each other and they're texting each other and not having eye contact, that's kind of problematic. So what we're noticing is that the residual of that is coming where students are actually engaging in more conversation. And it's a beautiful sight to see, you know, organizationally from an operation perspective, again, 3,700 students entering school with pouches and as such, we really had to do a great deal of planning and that planning actually started last March. And we've, we're still fine tuning some things, but again, we were very pleased with the, the, cur the current results that we're receiving. Thanks so much, Kevin. Uh, John, can you share how Buxton is approaching this? Yeah, um, so we went cell phone free three years ago. We did a pilot three and a half years ago now, which sounds wild to me. Um, but we are, um, the, the reason why we sort of looked into this is that I think as not just teenagers, but all adults, our lives moved pretty much all to screens and all online for the pandemic. Um, and I think one of the most impactful parts of education is the sort of connection that we build with each other in our classrooms, outside of the classrooms, in the hallways, at meals. Um, and we found that cell phones were the largest impediment to that. And when I say cell phones, I mean specifically smartphones. Um, at Buxton, we allow non-smartphones. So you can see my, my very old flip device here. Um, and I think that it's it's really wonderful to think about the phone as a tool. Um, it's a tool to talk to people. It's a, it's a tool to get in touch with people, but the sort of thousand notifications that come through the Instagrams, the Snapchats, kind of all of that pull us away from the community we're trying to create here in Williamstown. Um, and I think that community is really, really important to education, both inside and outside the classroom, right? Those like seven minutes between classes, you can, you'll see kids looking up, walking down the path, talking to each other, where three years ago, they'd be looking down, scrolling. 
same with the lunchroom. So I think it's just about making sure we're doing everything we can to remove the barriers between us and get to the core of what we're trying to do. Thanks so much. A common theme we heard from so many of you was community um, and the, the desire to influence your community positively. How do you involve community stakeholders, students, parents in the conversation around the policy with cell phones and moving forward, how do you plan to involve them? Anyone, please go ahead, Christine. Thanks so much. So the policy, again, it was really brought forward due to concern from teachers and students. Uh, last year, we had a growing student council that was somewhat new to, in the school. So they were also involved in developing the policy. Uh, over the summer, it really was a leadership team decision to move forward. However, even now, there are 11th and 12th grade students, which I'm sure Ephesine can also speak to at some point, that are continuing to come forward and try and put their own concerns and requests and speak with leadership on that. So we are creating a voice with the students through student council, through our advisories, through student representatives. Uh, they've also started a parent book club here at the school where they are studying the anxious generation. I believe that was the name of it. The one that I'm sure that most of us are very familiar with that really goes into the details of the uh, some of the issues that the cell phones bring to the school. So also continuing to open that conversation and have that book club conversation with parents to also bring them in on some of the deeper issues beyond just using the cell phone in the school and the difficulties on the tools. So definitely an ongoing conversation with everyone as, as we go through the process. Can I um, just say something as well? I think a lot of there's a lot of uh, misconception when it comes to the phone policy, especially at our school. And it's it has it wasn't just a concern of the parents and some of the uh, of the teachers and some of the students. It was also coming from a lot of parents, especially when um, a lot of younger students, parents from middle school and things like that, because they would see older students in high school who are supposed to be setting an example using their phones. And it sort of created a domino effect and it led to all of the middle school students thinking that they can do the same thing. And that started a whole tidal wave of concern from parents, which is, so there was a lot of blame sort of on the high school students, but it's under, it's understandable because you, we set an example for all of these younger students. So it's, that's why everyone came together to sort of form this new policy so fast because we decided that it would, it's important to sort of set an example for younger students and to show that like we are able to be off of our phones so they can too and I think that's what parents were really looking for and I we managed to achieve that so thank you so much for sharing that would would one of our other panelists like to share how their community is approaching policy as a, a collective uh, arrangement Kevin uh, one of the things that we really got to got in front of very early was having like town halls and, and just in forums, parent forums regarding this issue. And we did, we did quite, we get a few, and we did a lot of homework on this. And one of the things we wanted to emphasize, again, this wasn't punitive. We want to really get, and I, you know, I'll sound like a broken record all, all webinar long, but we really want to get that focus back into the educational realm because we're, lo we're looking at poor performance across the board of our students. And when we're looking at that performance and we're looking at our performances, not just on st uh, state assessments, but here looking at grade point averages, looking at attendance, looking at all a lot, a lot of metrics that are tr we were trending downward. And so by having this policy where the focus is right back into the classroom, it really, we, we have seen a difference. Secondly, when students couldn't communicate to each other, and what we're seeing is that they are talking more to teachers. They are talking more to each other in actual civil tones as well, which has really been a great, I think, a great benefit for us all. I did see one of the questions in the chat, 
you know, again, what happens if an emergency comes up? And that was the only, we, we really had very little pushback. When I say very little, that's an emphasis. Little, our community supported this, but they wanted to know in, in the case of an emergency, what would happen? So that means we had to upgrade our website with actual numbers to actual people. So in, 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 they, were, they can always have some way of communicating. One of the things we had to share with them is that with act, even without access or with access to a phone in an emerging situation, if there is a, someone on campus with a weapon and someone's phone goes off and it is not on silent, that's a problem. I said, so it didn't matter if they had the phone or not, something can happen. So, but we really wanted to make sure that our safety procedures were well in place and we had to put those out there as well. So it was really a lot of communication that went on with our community early on. And that lasted for about three or four months, even into the summer months. And it has really paid dividends for us. Thank you so much, Kevin. I uh, appreciate that. And I think let, let's go right into a question that is on the minds of a lot of our panelists and unfortunately something that we have to keep in our minds uh, in schools today. But uh, it sounds like a lot of the pushback doesn't come from the students itself. It certainly isn't coming from the educators in the classroom. Um, but there is a lot of education and we've already commented on it in a couple of other ways with parents. So how are your schools uh, responding to the desire from parents to be able to be in touch with their children at all times? And this could be from the perspective of emergencies, like Kevin just con uh, commented on, or from the perspective of responsibilities that students have outside of school, uh, other jobs, perhaps what time they need to be picked up from practice today, uh, anything from the mundane to the emergency. So um, maybe could I start maybe with a student perspective here, Ephesine, if you want to comment on this and then we can hear from a few others. Sure. So recent, actually today we had, we had like this advisory session, which is what we have implemented for the past two years at our school, which is when we create groups within the grade levels that talk about their concerns at school. And we just do sort of team building activities. And today we had a conversation about, um, fixing the phone policy so that we can communicate with our parents throughout the day, or at least for the IB students, so the 11th and 12th grade. But I personally, I have a lot of friends who are always in my ear saying, you're in the student council, you have a sway, like fix this, fix this. But they don't see that it's really hard because not only am I feeling a benefit, but they are also being benefited by having sort of like a distance from their parents, if that makes sense throughout the day, because we're, we're with them all the time. And they have, I feel students have a routine. They know that school finishes at 3.30. They know what they're doing after school. And it goes like that every week. If you have practice after school, you know that you're going to either finish school later or you're going to be picked up to go somewhere else. So I feel like students are really wanting to be able to communicate with their parents as an excuse to just use their phone because it's so normal for us to have our phones in our hands. It's so normal for us to do everything. And I, our, our school in particular, we've just said no. And as a student, I understand that. I'm not going against what they're saying. Even though it is hard, we, have, we agreed that the reception is in charge of if the parents really need to contact their students because there's something like drastic happening, then they will. And our school is not that big that we're gonna have to go all over the place searching for this one student. It's it's really, the whole situation is really blown out of proportion because it's, it's not that big of a deal unless, you know, someone is in crucial, in a medical situation and they're they're dying. Honestly, we can go throughout, throughout the day with peace like from our phones. And so at our school, it's such a issue. Our students are always arguing about it, but they have to just come to terms with the fact that it's really not gonna change, especially the first year, because the first year we're going, we're going strong and saying no. And maybe in the future, we could have a bit of compromise, but there are such positive benefits from what's happened that I don't see a need to have to communicate with my parents. And especially, I know the people complaining 
they they don't need to either. So it, I think very it's very much just an excuse to have your phone, which is kind of annoying, but I, I understand it. So I appreciate that perspective, Ephesine. And I think we're going to talk also next a little bit more about the student perspective. So we'd love to dig in a little bit more to the, the differing perspectives of students in your school. And just to continue down the line on parents for a few minutes, Aaron, would you be able to speak about the experience with your school? Um, first of all, I think that there was, um, I hate to use the term, but almost a silent majority of parents that were relieved that we went down this route because it helped um, fuel some conversations at home about phone use that, quite frankly, parents were waiting for us to have first with the kids. Um, so we got some positive feedback as far as that goes. We also got pushback from parents who want to be in complete communication with their students 24-7. Uh, um, where our school district met that need is um, up until this time, we um, had a student email system. We're, we're a Google school, so we have Gmail, and uh, Google Docs, and then Google Drive, and so on. Um, we had restrictions so that um, students and teachers were the only ones that could communicate via email, and students could not get emails from the outside, including their parents, and that was for safety reasons. You know, we don't want anybody trying to contact our students for nefarious reasons. Um, the compromise that we made is we opened up student email to outs uh, outside contact. Um, and then as a safeguard, we, ins we installed uh, a, a, a monitoring system called BARC. Um, and what it does is it alerts you if um, students are either receiving or getting sucked into um, uh, concerning email conversations and so on and so forth. Um, so that was a, our insurance to keep track of that, to make sure that students weren't getting, um, you know, nobody was, pr um, trying to go after them via email and so on and so forth. Um, and that also made the parents happier that they could contact their students uh, if they needed to. We also have a, we reminded everybody we, they had students had access to school telephones down in the main office, um, which a lot of people forgot about when cell phones, uh, became really prevalent. So <laughs> the, the two steps that we took. Great, thank you. Would anybody else like to comment on the parent perspective, John? Yeah, I mean, I think that something at Buxton we're always pretty wary about is technological solutions to human problems. Um, I think that something that we're seeing um, and we have been seeing is sort of this like want for parents to always be able to contact their kids. Um, and pre-smartphones and pre-everyone having a cell phone, the way you would contact your kid when they were in school is you'd call the front office and the front office would have to interrupt a class and you'd have to think about the social norms and like, like, so essentially like how important is it that you get in touch with your kid? Should you interrupt the class? Should you interrupt the learning? Um, and I think resetting those expectations with parents of what is appropriate to pull your kid out from the thing that we are doing here, which is teaching and interrupting that is actually a huge deal, right? We're teachers. We really love what we do. We don't want to be contending with five other things in the classroom. And we want to make sure that the students in our class are learning. Um, and so I think resetting those norms and expectations of parents and communicating that, which is if there's an emergency, we have it covered. We'll let you know, right? So like I'm a first responder, people on their phones cause us way more harm than good when we're in those situations. Um, however, most of the time you actually don't need to be in touch with your kid immediately. And if the front office gets in touch with your student in between classes, that's totally acceptable. Um, so just, I think it's about communication, resetting norms and resetting this idea for both adults and students of immediate availability all the time. It's not good for us as teachers. It's not good for students. It's not good for anybody. Like they focus on what you're doing. Thank you, John. Would anybody else like to comment on the parent question? So I just want to remind everybody, we have a, a really active chat going. So many of you are answering each other's questions in addition to the panelists answering the questions. So make sure to check that out. Also, our panelists are additionally answering questions in the Q&A. So take a look there. If there's a question that you have, it may have been uh, typed in and answer as well. The benefit of having so many uh, on our panel today is that we're answering questions in many different directions. And I failed to mention that all of the questions we're asking today were questions that you did submit as a part of the registration process. So we're getting to as many of them as we can, um, but the chat and the Q&A is another avenue for you to do that. We'll turn it back over to Edie. 
JP, did you want to add in um, on the parent piece? Go for it. Um, so just for some context about Buxton is our school bans smartphones, like John said earlier. Um, so uh, parents are still like able to contact throughout the day. And like, especially because we have a few day students that go to our school as well. Like those um like flip phones and stuff are helpful for like getting in contact about when to like pick up and whatever, uh, like pick your kid up. Um, and but also most students have um like laptops, uh, iPads, whatever. Um, so a lot of the times, uh, uh, parents will just use that to contact one as well, and um, and yeah. Thanks so much, Ruby. That's an important piece of the of the puzzle. Let's shift gears a little bit and turn towards our students. Uh, how? has having more structure around your cell phone usage at school um, and during the school day impacted your experience and, and that of your peers? Um, have there been any unexpected benefits? Uh, Ruby, do you mind starting us off? Thanks. Um, I would say that the biggest surprise is something that Mr. McCaskill kind of touched on, but the fact that we're just talking to each other more because prior to like, yeah, we would be texting all through class and like maybe my friend has a class on the hallway and that's where we're talking. We're like, okay, let's go meet up. Let's go walk around. Let's go up to the bathroom. But now it's, we're sitting in class and we're having these conversations, maybe not just with our friends that were in class, but like as a entire class. And I feel that it builds more community throughout, not just the classroom, but the entire school, seeing as that we're now all maybe talking to people that we wouldn't have before, and we're learning different perspectives, maybe helping each other out on different work that before maybe we would just go and look up on our phone really quick. But now we can see everybody's different perspective. And I feel also another aspect of in class, it allows us to be more focused because we don't have that, oh, I'm just going to go play a game on my phone or go on TikTok or something because now we're sitting there and we're listening to the lecture or making sure that we're completing our assignment because there's quite nothing else to do. You, you're forced to sit there and, and do the work versus say, oh, I'm going to finish it at home because you're going to finish it now because that's what is in front of you. And that's really the only option that you have. Thanks so much. JP, uh, do you mind sharing a little bit about your experience? Yeah, um, very similar to what Ruby said, but also also very similar for like social situations. Um, so one of the like main, a big thing a big uh, time in our days where you could like notice the impact that smartphones had on our community was during like meal times. So like after, um, after like everyone was done eating and we would like, there'd be kind of like a few awkward like minutes of in between time where there wasn't really much to do before the next thing started. Um, people would just immediately like go on their phones and kind of just tune everyone else out. Um, but now, uh, since we've had that smartphone ban, it's a lot of the time you don't want to just like sit there, you know, silently. So I've found that a lot of people like seek out each other and um, go and walk around to like different tables and like start a conversation with someone or join a conversation and um, kind of just interact with each other more, you know, um, and yeah. So that's pretty, pretty exciting. And I feel like not even at meal times that's happened um, throughout like all situations at school. Um, and yeah. Thank you. Ephesine, you had shared a little bit earlier on. Do you want to add anything about other thoughts with students? Sure. So we have, as Ruby said, a big, like we love our community at school. And before COVID, it was super uh, everyone it still is like this that everyone knew each other everyone was always together and then we went online and everyone just distanced from each other and we came back and all of a sudden we were all in high school and we had more responsibilities and we used our phones more and just the phones being taken away like the second week of school I just noticed how everyone you walk into school in the morning and everyone's talking to each other it's not 
like it used to be where people were just sitting on their phones you know it was too early and no one was talking to each other it was super social and it's the same during recess it's the same during lunch we all we have genuine conversations and I'm also talking to people that I didn't know before that I didn't talk to before because we didn't have the same interests or we weren't in the same class but now I just have built so many more connections and relationships with people that I didn't think that I would. And it's also helped benefit our community. Again, it's uh, sort of strengthened it. And because we have a very large sports community. So instead of uh, people sitting inside when it was cold and because it gets very cold in Krakow right now, it's like 10 degrees and it's only October. So we instead of people sitting inside we're all like okay let's go outside let's play volleyball let's do whatever and we're outside together and it it really helps take the edge off of school so it's really nice thank you that's great to, it's great to hear those different you know but common um perceptions of how this is impacting your daily life at school so we're going to change gears a little bit. There's been a lot of conversation in the chat about yonder patch, uh, pouches. Uh, Kevin, you're a resident expert. Could you tell us a little bit about how they're working at your school? I don't know about resident expert. This is our first year of implementation. I think we've got more than anyone else probably. But, you know, it, it's gone. I saw something in the chat, you know, it was about you know, what, is, what are the implications if a student violates? And we have a progressive discipline, we have a progressive discipline model where after a first offense, if students have it out, they are asked to put the, you know, they put the phone within their pouch. A second offense, the phone is taken and held with the administrators and given back at the end of the day with a letter indicating if there's a third offense, your parent must come in. If they do a third offense, the phone is confiscated and we will wait for a parent to come and pick up the come and pick up the phone any subsequent after that now they are in sub they're subject to the code of conduct within the brockton public schools so every opportunity is given where a gift to become more responsible but you know so far so good and one of the things it was more operational for us seeing that we have 3700 students coming into four houses and how does that operate from you know when students arrive and dismissal so we really had to do a lot operationally, really getting all hands on deck in the morning, as well as opportunities for students to unlock their pouches, get their pouches unlocked, and then run to their respective buses who, if they start rolling, they've missed the bus. So we really, we, our biggest concerns were not so much with students putting them in. Students have been fit, really compliant of getting that done. And I got to applaud our student body for really getting it done but really the work came from an operational perspective of how do we really manage that every single day for 180 days. And I'm really proud of the efforts of our staff and the students with the way that they have accepted the policy. Well, I say some, some still more begrudgingly than others, but for the most part, it has, it's been successful, but we really want to have a, a wait and see to do an assessment at the end of the year. Thanks, Kevin. And a follow-up question. How do you manage uh, the needs of individual students who might need to have um, a, a different type of uh, approach to cell phone use uh, because of, of just their personal situation? And, and that's as an as-need basis. For example, if we have students with disabilities who have a phone written into their IEP, uh, we do make an accommodation instead of the locking pouch they use a Velcro and that Velcro, that Velcro pouch is given to the teacher. So when it, the time is appropriate to utilize the phone, they have access to the phone. We have set up stations for athletics and our other extra and co-curricular activities that occur after school where students are immediately dispatched to their respective areas and their phones are unlocked because access is very important and not just for those activities, but for those students who work those students who may be responsible for younger siblings. So it's really, we have not had any great difficulty with that process going forward. And again, we're always monitoring our processes, making sure that we can always improve them if, if needed. Thanks so much.
Kelly, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Yeah. Sure. So I, we we started answering this a bit, and Kevin, I appreciate you you added some comments on this, but we've had a lot of questions in the chat and in the Q&A about what happens with non-compliance. So obviously, especially in year one, there's a lot to get used to. We heard from FSC and that the students are constantly discussing, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Um, not everyone is using the pouches. Uh, which of course locks things down quite quite a bit. Um, what is your policy in your various schools uh, for non-compliance with the cell phone policy that you have? And how's it working? <laughs> Aaron, let's start with you. Uh, much like Brockton High School, we have progressive discipline that starts with a, a warning and a conversation and then can escalate from there. Um, we do use, um, for repeated offenses, um, if a student hasn't pouched their phone, we have um, office pouches that we use, um, taking it for the day, involving the parents, uh, detentions and so on, right on up through internal suspension if necessary. I'll tell you, we really haven't reached that, that nth degree with internal suspension with any students um, because, the, quite frankly, most students just don't want to get in trouble for using their cell phones. Um, they just don't want to. Um, at the very least, that that whole... That whole conversation is a hassle for them, so they're keeping them away. Um, I'll tell you, we did start with yonder pouches last year. Uh, to be more specific, we started with a no cell phone rule at the beginning of last year, but the yonder pouches didn't arrive until mid-October. Uh, and then we launched the yonder pouches. So just when we thought we had things going well, it's like we ripped the wound open again and uh, had to have re-engaged the, the students and the families about um, uh, the cell phone policy. But um, I'll be brutally honest, um, the, the Yonder pouches are um, were a means to an end. They were able to drive uh, cell phone usage back underground where it needs to be in order to teach and learn. Um, the vast majority of our students are not pouching their phones now in year two. Um, they're, they're just, they're just not using them during class. They're not using them in the halls. We, we don't see them in the halls and we don't see them at lunch. Um, it's just become more of a, a, a common practice than anything, but to get back to the point of the question, discipline, it's progressive discipline. We have about eight to 10 steps. Um, folks are free to email me if they would like the copy of it. Great. Um, and, uh, some follow-ups I'm seeing in the chat about uh, progressive discipline being great for the students. And what about the parents that are, are refusing um, the, you know, how this policy, kind of the, the tenets of this policy even being in place? Um, any advice there? It's a very difficult question, but I know, John, you had your hand raised, so we'll go back to the original question. But if anybody also wants to comment on, um, you know, maybe parents not supporting the policy. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest with where we're at with that policy right now, which is that the point of the policies of our policies to make sure cell phones aren't a part of our daily lives. Um, that meant in the boarding school context, many students kind of sneaking them in their dorms, hiding them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then it created this sort of distrust between students and faculty of making like if we were to walk in and see a student on their phone, we would take it. Right. And because we're a boarding school, you're not going to get it back the next break which could be anywhere from one to five weeks from now um that created a really high stakes moment between students and faculty and that's what we're currently trying to revise in our policy with our students through conversation which is in what ways can we make this an honest open relationship with our devices between students and faculty so that that level of distrust and ultimately that that level of coercion it's minimized or eliminated. Um, the, I don't think that there's any question in our community about the benefits of living a smartphone-free public life. I think it's more about how students are being asked to regulate and how we're um, how we're managing it. Now, as an aside for other boarding school uh, people here, I'm sure there's some people on the call, definitely don't take a smartphone and put it in media mail to send back to parents. USPS gets really mad at that. Um, <laughs> Trick of the trade, a little tip for everyone. <laughs> Sounds like a good one to abide by. Uh, any student perspectives on this? Or are there any discipline measures in place that you think are are helpful to, to kind of keeping these policies or is it not really part of the conversation when you're talking among your peer groups? At the scene? Um, 
So we have had a lot of problems with that because what happens here is basically this, the teachers just, if they see a phone out, they just take it and they give it to the principal. And so it's not as extreme as I think other schools have it. I honestly don't know what are the next degrees in terms of if the, if there's another offense with the phone, but um, so it's not as extreme that like you don't get your phone back for one to five weeks if you're in a boarding school. But um, I think that we, our school also touches on, on headphone usage as well, which is a problem that even I can agree with. Um, it's quite annoying if, uh, because we're allowed to listen to music if it comes from like an iPad or a computer, but a lot of, there's not, a lot of teachers don't have the same sort of idea of what they can take and what they can't take from a student. So they'll see like a student walking down the hallway with their headphones in their hands and they'll just take it from them, even though they're not being in use. And then another teacher will be like, yeah, go ahead and use it. So there's a, definitely a problem with um, the communication between, um, around the school between the faculty about how to how to go about the phone policy and that's something that's annoying because it's us that are affected by it it's not the teachers and a lot of students also have concerns with seeing balance as well so the, the teachers are also off their phones and it's not just a one-way street that it's just us because we have a lot of teachers in the school that say that they're not allowed to use their phones either and they don't. And then we have teachers that are like using their phones all the time. So it's really, it gets confusing for the students and that's where it can get quite upsetting. But we, again, we understand where this is coming from and we understand we have just broken a rule. So we know why it's being taken, but the lines are really blurred sometimes. And that's something that students are concerned about. I don't think teachers care as much because they just see the, the phone and they just take it but that's just something that we lack is the communication about what specifically should or should not be done in when 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 technology is seen i have seen i'd love to follow up on something I, we'll go to uh let me go to ruby and then i'm gonna uh, follow up on one of those things that you brought up go ahead ruby um almost i agree with Abyssinian. i would say that the biggest issue in the discipline is the discrepancies going to such a large school it is broken up into um four houses so it's one big building but there are four different cafeterias um with four different colors and every student is assigned to a building so for the following two stories upwards that that's the same color as the room that you're assigned to and they all have their own um like principal or dean of that specific building and a lot of times it's found that the disciplinary and the implement of this um the system is different between each building and that a lot of students are saying oh well I'm allowed to do this in red but I'm not allowed to do this in azure so how is that fair because they're doing this and I feel like that's where we come into a big issue of if everyone's not on the same board then it's not being as um, efficient as possible. Great. Thanks, Ruby. So the what I wanted to follow up on that FSCN brought up is we've had a couple of questions in the Q&A about adults not being great at managing cell phone use. So we're, we're asking a lot of our young people, but but we all, I, I mean, I think we can all raise up our cell phones that are probably sitting right here in front of us, all the, the educators and leaders on the panel here. Um, how are we helping model appropriate cell phone use? So perhaps you're not allowed to use them during the school day, but an appropriate connection with technology, given that your students are going to head off to university, they're going to be self-regulating. Um, you know, what kind of practices are modeling? Is this a part of the discussion at your schools? Aaron, let's start with you. Um, one of the things when they the school committee re revised the cell phone policy, they also built in and they had to carefully phrase it for educators in our school district. But um, that educators should refrain from using them uh, during instructional time. Um, we have a teacher's union, obviously, that you have to have conversations with. And um, I know the school district didn't want to go so far down the path of banning them for, for educators and so on. Um, but I, I can only speak for myself. And that is that I made a big deal last year when we rolled out this policy of making sure students understood that I was not going to be walking around school with my cell phone. Um, I became very reliant on it as an administrator, and I had to change my ways uh, of working within the school day um, to not have my cell phone on me all the time. Um, 
um, which probably didn't make my wife too happy. Um, uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that I keep, I bring it to school. I keep it in my office. I don't, I don't t uh, carry it around the building. I'm out and about in the building all the time. I'm rarely in my office during the day. Um, so that's a way to model it. And I know other teachers have tried to do the same in their classrooms. Great. FSC? So I know that um, the way that everyone, because everyone is always around each other at school. So you get a lot of perspectives from students of all ages. And now the younger generations, they start to have phones. I mean, I do a lot of babysitting and I see six-year-olds pulling out their phones that are better than mine. And I'm, it's just so unsettling. And um, I think that as older students who are being affected by this the most, because we use our phones the most, we have to understand like we have to sort of overcome the immaturity that we have with our phones and just understand that we need to set an example for the younger generations to that are going to eventually grow up and potentially misuse their their phones or like phone usage could just sort of create um diff wrong of like opinions when it comes to other important things um, for these younger generations. And I know people always disagree and people want to use their phones and, you know, nothing can ever be perfect. But if we are, we're getting ready to go into the next, a new chapter of our lives and to graduate and go into uh, university. And especially coming from such a small school, we have to realize that um, that life is not like on your phone. How, because if you don't know how to socialize with people, then you don't, how are you going to make friends when you go to university? How are you going to deal with, like, I go to a school with around like 375 people and I, I am talking to my friends who have graduated and gone to uni and they're in classes with 400 people in one class. So it's, it's scary. And having no more phones has really shown the sort of psychological background of people. So who is introverted, who doesn't know how to deal without their phones. And it's, that's something that we really have to learn with this no phone policy is how you can, so now that phones are not um, allowed, how we can help these people that are clearly not ready you know, to deal with not having their phones around them all the time. Because like I have a younger brother who's in middle school and that was such a problem at home as well with phones and um, that he's always on it. And he's very different from me. He doesn't know how to live without his phone kind of and it just shows that if he, he's like that then most likely many of his friends are like that and it's sort of frustrating for people who know how to deal without their phones but we just have to set a bigger example and also sort of try and help other people and this is not just a punishment it's sort of like a learning experience for everyone appreciate that ruby or, or jp do you have any thoughts about this as you kind of move into work or university where where the policies are going to be different it's going to be more up to you um i feel that having our phones away is definitely bettering our communication skills because now not only we're communicating with our our students and we're also communicating with our staff and it's showing us that you don't not everything's on the phone you don't always just have to send the message you can go up to your teacher and you can talk about maybe what you didn't understand or if you can have that extra help and just learning how to properly address things with like the right tone of voice and the words that you use, I feel though as it is gonna make a big difference because so so much of our lives have been on screens for the past four years that now by removing this one aspect, even if it's only for part of your day, like the six hours that you're in school, just having that little bit of screen fee socialization, well, not completely screen fee because we do have our computers like that we're completing our work on, but the social aspect of it being off of the screen the screens allows us to communicate with each other, which will then help us when we go to um, our future. Thank you. Christine, I think maybe I saw you raise your hand. Oh, yes, uh, I just wanted to also agree with what Effie was saying and add in to some things that I saw some people saying in the chat of, uh, shouldn't we be teaching students to use the phones properly rather than just getting rid of them? And I think that that has been the path that we've talked about taking for several years. And we're just discovering that based on uh, number one, 
developmental brain development and maturity, that can be very, very difficult to do. And number two, it, realizing that these devices are being purposely designed to be addictive for children, for adults. Uh, when we see how difficult it is as, as teachers to be able to put our phones down. And I think that there's more value right now of being able to say, this is what life without a cell phone looks like. So that when you go to university, you've had that experience. You, you see what it can be. Like the students were saying, you're starting to learn uh, how to have those real conversations and have those interactions. And I think even as teachers, one of the challenges that was presented to us this year, because we don't have an exception policy at all, and we had grown very reliant as teachers on, well, pull out the cell phones and use them for this tool, for this lesson, for this photo, and having to even challenge the teachers of, let go of that a bit. What are some other approaches to teaching and learning that we can get the cell phone out of the hands, off the desks, because it is too easy to just roll into that process of now that the cell phone is out for a legitimate use, very easy to just fall into checking games, social media. And I think it's been a good, uh, a good reset for the teachers and the students in approach to teaching and learning. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And turn back to Edie for a question before we do our wrap up. Sure. Uh, John, actually, I saw you put your hand up. Did you want to okay. add in to this part of the conversation? Um, a smartphone is like a digital pocket knife in that it does a lot of things, but it doesn't really do anything well. Um, you, no one's ever like, wow, I'm so excited to watch the new feature film on my 3.4 inch device. Um, and so as we think about like talking to educators, it's how are we resourcing and planning our lessons effectively to utilize the best tools to get across what we're trying to do. In some cases, the smartphone might be the best tools, but I think teachers have been creative for hundreds, if not thousands of years on how we want to get our learning objectives across. And I think as someone who's worked at a smartphone free school for a long enough time, the benefits so like so greatly outweigh the costs of bringing the right technology into the classroom as opposed to like using your smartphone as the only technology in the classroom. So thank you, Christine, for that. I think you're spot on there. Thanks, John. And that's a great segue into the idea of uh, the other technologies uh, that we have at our fingertips, specifically are the laptops and, and the internet access. Does, does anyone want to speak to the way that this conversation around cell phones potentially has evolved or innovated the way that laptops are being used in the classroom or around school? Thanks, Aaron. We are a one-to-one uh, -one Chromebook school. Um, so the students are certainly, uh, in, at the, in the initial reaction, we're trying to rely on, uh, Chromebooks in various ways to communicate with one another. Um, and, uh, and that's fine, but at the end of the day, what I'm finding, and this is kind of an outcropping, not only of the cell phone issue, but from our experiences during COVID is that, um, teachers are actually starting to migrate away from so many, um, device based platforms for for learning and um are coming up with um more non technologically not uh, creative but non technologically based uh, uh learning experiences for students um i think that we're we're kind of re reaching this uh, saturation point with screen time in general um in in education and uh that seems to be where the conversation's shifting in, in my school Thanks so much, Eric. Yes, Kevin. Yeah, just to piggyback on that, yeah, we're seeing a lot more hands-on. And, and I think we're seeing much more engagement with students. And that is the way to go. I, obviously, with we have a ways to go with the way our, where our Wi-Fi here with 3,700 and, and laptops and such, we've got to do a better job of accessibility. But I really see a lot of great teaching going on and the engagement is just so it's such a huge and vast difference from one year to the next. So kudos to our staff for really making education come alive here throughout the high school. 
Hey, and time flies when we only have an hour to dig into such a complex topic from so many perspectives. So uh, we're going to have to move into wrapping up. I know we have so much more to share and, and you all have so much more to ask out in the audience. Um, I'm going to do two really quick questions. Uh, one, the first I just want to mention, I think we it's possible we've gone this entire hour without saying the word ban. Uh, or referencing in a certain way. And I, I just want to call out the intentionality of that. And I'm wondering if real quick, I could just hear from someone from each school, what is the phrase or terminology that you use? Because I, I really appreciate the focus on, on the more positive side of this. So maybe we could just go around real quick. Aaron, if you could start and then Kevin, John, over to Christine. We use the word expectation. Cell phone free environment. John? Oh, couldn't hear you there. Your audio oh. is. Um, we use mindful technology policy. Mindful technology. Great. Christine? Uh, fairly simple. Just cell phone policy. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. So we're going to let everyone uh, give a kind of a last word or last piece of advice. We'll keep it very short. Something you, if, if, People only listen to kind of one comment from this webinar, uh, either a lesson learned or a key resource or a piece of advice. We're just going to go around the room real quick. So let's start with uh, Kevin and Ruby. Really create, we really just wanted to create an atmosphere that really put the focus back on education and performing student, student outcomes. And also to really get back to the art of conversation. It has been such it has been such a great opening. I don't want to jinx it, but a great opening of school. And we're looking at this this policy will and it's just here at the high school. And if we're if the model really works, we'll probably look at putting this down into our middle schools so it's a more sustainable system going forward. Thank you. Ruby. I would say to other students that were schools are going to implement something or that are worried about if there's going to implement something I would say that it's really not as bad as you think it's going to be because you might think oh well if you don't have your phone you're going to miss out on this this and that but nobody else has their phone either so nothing's going on that you're not going to hear about or that you can't text your friends about because they don't have it either so it's really not that bad great I'll go to Aaron next Really glad Ruby said that. It was refreshing to hear students say that. So um, I have just three points to make. First of all, initially it's hard to do, but sometimes the right thing is the hard thing. So that we realized that this was the right thing to do, even though it was hard to put together, so to speak, and make that leap. A statement about yonder pouches. Um, I see them as a means to an end. I don't see them as necessarily the most permanent of solutions. They're a means to an end. They drove cell phones back underground uh, and they helped change uh, some behaviors at our school and shift mindset uh, and open up new conversations. And then just one piece of evidence, uh, three years ago before we dealt, we, we, we um, had the new cell phone policy, we had uh, quite a few what I call real-time social media conflicts, particularly on Snapchat during the school day, real-time things happening um, and so on and so forth. Last year, our first year of implementation with the cell phone policy, we had zero. So that's just a piece of evidence that some people might want to run with. Thank you. Let's go to John and JP next. Yeah, I think that um, learning is best when you're in connection with your students, when students are in connection with each other. Um, and I think that it's our job as educators to try to remove all the barriers we can between all that connection. Um, so I think if we take our job seriously, we should you should really, really consider what role cell phones are taking in your classroom and classrooms um, and be thinking about how we can best facilitate the removal of those barriers. And I'm sure JP will be more eloquent. Than... I don't know if I will. I was, I was, um, I think that intention, like really being intentional with why you're setting up this plan and also establishing and sharing that intention with your community um, is very, very important. And it's also like, it's important for the students and the faculty, like everyone who's going to be like affected by it so they can understand kind of like the plan with it. But it's also important um, 
uh it's also important oh I lost my thought um it's also important to as a way to like keep yourself in check um and yeah thank you so much JP and let's go to Ephesine and then Christine so just like Ruby said, is really not that big of a deal. It really hasn't, the only benefits that I've seen are like positive benefits, just like feeling better mentally, like physically, I, I don't have headaches during the day as much anymore. Um, and just enhancing the community. I think that the in the long run, if this, if everyone learns how to not use their phones, as much anymore than potentially these policies could be taken away but there's nothing that serious about what is happening because we still finish school at like at 3 30 and we can still have our phones after and it's not like we've missed anything serious so there's only benefits to this policy that i see thank you christine i think my message would be to to students, to teachers, to everyone involved, instead of looking for reasons to make exceptions, because I feel like that's often the conversation from the very beginning is, what's the exception to it? When can we use it? When would this work? Instead of looking for reasons to make exceptions, jump in by just finding the unexpected joys of being a little more disconnected for a while and some of the different approaches that we can take to to teaching to, to learning to life and yeah embrace that and see what can happen because i think it people are pleasantly surprised uh even when there's Great. Thank you so much, Christine. JP, I'm going to I'm going to send it back to you just for a second because I know you put it in the chat, but if you want to give that your closing thought there. Um, what I meant to say was that I think um, establishing and sharing like an intention with it is also um, a helpful way to get people on board so they like know where you're coming from and can maybe like sympathize and share that. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think that's a great closing out. I think that's that's what we've really heard here today from all four of your school experiences. Um, I hope that our panelists have gotten a chance to look at the chat because uh, there's some grateful appreciation from educators and students around the world coming through there. Um, thank you to a huge thank you to our panelists for offering up their perspective. There's a great vulnerability to coming online with uh, strangers from around the world and sharing your perspective. So we really appreciate you taking the time to do so. It was clearly very meaningful to our community of learners. Um, thank you to all of our audience members for spending the last hour with us to dig into this topic. Thank you all for being with us today and we wish you a great rest of the day or evening, depending on where you are. So. Thanks, everyone.